on a job trying to understand well good morning welcome to redemption church my name is josh i'm one of the pastors here go ahead and stand with me as we're going to go into our scripture reading if you're visiting with us uh we'd love to connect with you it's easy to do all you have to do is scan the qr code on the bulletin that we have back there you should have received walking in uh, also, we have Connect cards there in front of you in the, the chairs. You can fill that out and take it to the Connect desk, and we'll not only uh, answer any questions you have, but have a small gift for you. And, and uh, I would love to, to personally follow up with you this next week just to hear your story, answer any questions you have about the church or Jesus or something that happened here this morning. Uh, hear your story on uh, where you are on your journey of, of faith, whether you're a believer looking for a church or a person who's just investigating Christianity. We want to be a hospitable, welcoming community where, uh, regardless of where you are, that uh, you find friends and a safe space to, to process, again, your, your questions or your feelings or concerns or, or any ways that we can help. If you've been a part of our uh, a, a gatherings for a while and are looking for ways to connect deeper, that's also a, a way to do that. We've got ministry teams and community groups, Bible studies, missional outreach events, uh, things like that. Uh, but when we gather on Sundays, it's, it's really to remind ourselves and then stir ourselves up uh, around the person of Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done, the implications on our lives, and, uh, and what He's calling us to be and do, specifically as individuals as well as a church. And uh, Ephesians 2 really does sum up the crux, the center of, of our faith. It says, Because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, and how about this good news, it is by grace that you have been saved. That's pretty sufficient to get, give us reasons to sing this morning. Welcome to Redemption Church.
Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him. Yet I look to worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. But mine is hope and my Redeemer, though I fall, His love is sure, for Christ has paid for every failing, I am His forevermore. Mine are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel, where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven, and the strength in time. His work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a narrow way. One with Christ I will encounter harm and hatred for his name but mine is armor for this battle strong enough to last the war and he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore and mine are keys to Zion city where beside King, I walk for there. My heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come, rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone, and hope is sure. Romans chapter 5 verses 8 through 11 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. (laughs) 
Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. man in his living in his suffering neither trace nor strain of sin see the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand come behold the wondrous mystery christ the lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love untold Well, it was September 25th in 2020 when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, It was a Friday, and if you know me, I I have a little side hustle where I'll mow yards on Fridays. And uh, that morning when I I noticed that, uh, started to mow my first yard, I noticed that my phone wasn't charged all night. It was about to die, and so I usually listen to podcasts and music, and music. And so I left it in my car uh, to charge while I mowed that first yard. And I don't know if this is true or not, but it's supposed to charge faster on airplane mode. So I threw it to airplane mode and spent the next hour uh, cutting grass. When I got back in the car and 
flipped it back on, my phone blew up with text and missed calls, uh, almost all of them from my immediate family, except for my oldest son, Danny. Uh, my first thought was, obviously, something's happened, and Dan's somehow involved. Uh, called my wife right away, who told me that my stepfather, who was 60 years old, had had a heart attack and collapsed and died while on vacation in Florida with my mother. And obviously, we were all in crisis. Uh, I don't think I've ever uh, told anybody this, but I was only about 10 minutes away from the house where I made my way and uh, with tears in my eyes, uh, prayed out loud and said, Holy Spirit, I need power. I don't know why I asked for that specifically. I, I didn't ask for comfort. I didn't ask for wisdom or insight, although that was a part of my asking for power. But I, I knew that I, I was going to need to be there for my mother and to somehow get her home, as well as Jeff's body. I, I knew that I was going to be looked to from not only my immediate family, but extended family for pastoral leadership that there would be moments where I would need to read the room and say this is a time to just be silent. Other times uh, I would want to facilitate discussion. Other times I would speak in comfort from the scriptures. Uh, that there over the next week of processing would need to even be celebration of his life and the joy that we can have as Christians and the hope and grief and pain uh, just a lot of different moving parts, and, and all of it was a cry out to the Holy Spirit to do something in me, as well as all of us, and through us, uh, what we, we had no ability to do in ourselves. And he answered that prayer, uh, probably more viscerally than any other time in my life, there was a supernatural feeling of God's presence his comfort, his wisdom and insight. And to this day, we get comments from people who were at the funeral or celebration of life that it was a beautiful Christ-honoring event while at the same time celebrating the life of Jeff and uh, a display of how Christians can walk through that, that type of thing. It, it had really very, very little to do with any of us. We were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want to celebrate good news with you this morning that that is available for every single person in here. And not just for crisis moments. You can have it right now or in the ordinary Monday morning of tomorrow. It's not reserved for pastors or people who are, or have somehow attained some status of spirituality, that every single person who is in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore is a Christian, is expected. It's not just available, but it is expected that you would be regularly filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you become a Christian, you now begin to live life on a spiritual level. An invisible spiritual plane. We're embodied creatures, and so our bodies are important and matter, and they're very much who we are. But when you put your faith in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and now you are alive spiritually in a way that you never were before. And in a way that people without Christ uh, are. That you, uh, and all of us do this, start the Christian life and this therefore spiritual life by putting your faith in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That will have looked different for every Christian in here, but we all came to the same person. By grace, through faith. And from then on... 
you're living out that Christian life is in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it's there where I find many Christians' things get a little fuzzy. How does this work? Uh, how do I experience that? What am I to do or not do? What should I expect would be the results? See, it's a lot easier for us to, to relate to God the Father. We all have fathers. It's, it's easier for us to relate to God the Son, the person of Jesus who took on full humanity. He's like us in that way. But the Spirit is invisible. And we find ourselves relating to a God we, we can't see and praying to a God we can't hear and hoping to live on a realm that is, is by faith, moving forward to a, a, a world and a life beyond this one. We put our hope and confidence in that. And all of it is based on a book that's very, very old. And at times, hard to understand. Uh, I have my Bible open. You don't have to turn to this one, although I'll have you turn to other places. To Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. And this is probably my favorite verse that sums up these two aspects of the Christian life of having come to Christ and then walking that out in the Holy Spirit. It says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That we put our faith in Christ, we've received Him. John 1 says, To, to as many that received Him, that is, believed in His name, that's how you receive Him, as you believe in who He is and what He's done, his perfect life for you, His death on the cross for your sins, His resurrection for new life. As you receive Him, He gives you the right to become a child of God. And you have all of the status and position that that relationship gives you. You are saved. You are a believer. You are a new cre creation. You are forgiven. You are declared righteous. You are viewed holy and blameless before a holy and blameless God. That is your status. So, now that you have that, so walk in Him. Live out of that identity. Walk like Christ. Both aspects of that conversion and Christian life are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That the reason you received Him, believed in His name, is because the Holy Spirit regenerated you. We looked at that in previous weeks. Your eyes were opened to see the beauty of Christ. Your heart was softened so that you saw your need and welcomed Him into your life. Your will was liberated so that you freely chose to believe on Jesus and receive Him. That same Holy Spirit that drew you to Christ is this, the same spirit that you are to be dependent on to live like Jesus Christ. You following? Let me give you an illustration. Uh, let's say you have a brand new car that you not only are looking forward to moving you about the world to the places that you want to be, but it comes with all these perks and, and benefits uh, that you, you want to enjoy as you move about in that vehicle. If you're going to do that, you need two things. First, you need a key. The key is what is going to give you access and ownership of that vehicle that gets you in behind the wheel so that you are now able to enjoy and operate the vehicle as intended. It also is needing to be in the ignition or in the car, I guess, to push the ignition button now so that that car will turn from a cold, lifeless thing to a living, vibrant, powerful machine. Second thing that you, that you need is gas. You need fuel that will fire in the engine and therefore not only get you there, but get you there in the way that you want to, do, to, to go. What the key is to the car, the cross of Jesus Christ, is to your salvation, to your Christian life. Through faith in Christ, He is the key that unlocks 
our access to God and Father. He is the one who, who ignites and gives the, the ability to, to live like he lived. He, he not only brings with him forgiveness of sin and our, our new standing before God, but he gives us a whole new direction in life to where we are going to go. What the fuel is to the vehicle, the Holy Spirit is to the Christian life. And in the Spirit, we always have a full tank of ability and power to get where we need to go. And as we depend on that key and that gas to move us through our Christian life, we're operating in the way we are intended to live. But we all have examples of people we've seen or experiences in our own life in which we won't do that. While we've got all of the equipment and the ability in God to be what He calls us to be, we foolishly think we can depend on ourselves. And so, if you'll allow the analogy a little further, we'll get out of the vehicle and get in behind the, the trunk and start to push the car where we want to go. And we don't like where this road's taking us, so we'll go off road and the Christian life becomes us gutting out in our ability, off in the weeds of life, as opposed to getting in behind the wheel, operating in the fuel of the Spirit. When we do that, we are being filled with the Spirit. That's what it means. All right. Before we get to the main text that I'm going to look at in Ephesians 5, stop off next in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6, and we're going to read of yet another thing, another ministry, an aspect that is vitally important for us to understand of the Holy Spirit uh, that is closely connected to the ministry of the filling of the Spirit. And uh, I find that many Christians are unaware of this ministry. And it's, it's vital. It's so important. We read of it in verse 19. Uh, Do you not know? See, we're not alone in not knowing this. There, even in the first century, many Christians didn't know this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Therefore... You are not your own. Did you know that, Christian? That you are not your own? That you're not in charge ultimately of you? You're responsible for you. You're culpable for you. But you are not ultimately sovereign over you. That, that God calls the shots. And, and you learn that, or should learn that, Immediately, once you become aware and self-conscious of yourself, almost everything about you and I has been already predetermined by God. He decided what year you would be born, what day, what parents you would get, the time and place in which you would live, how tall you would be, what color hair or eyes you would have, the emotional makeup and personality that you have, the different giftings that you get as opposed and over against what other people get, the intellectual quotient of your brain and your mind. And I, I could go on to a, a, a thousand other things. All demonstrations that being a creature of a creator, that you completely belong to another person. That's true of every person who's ever been born. However, this tells us that it is extra true or in an elevated way or deeper way maybe for children of God, for those who've trusted Christ. You are not your own because you were bought with a price that the blood of Jesus Christ has purchased us from sin and called us into His family. So glorify God in your body. That because you are doubly bought, you are doubly expected to glorify God with how you live your life. And good news, you are now 
able to do it as one who has been bought. John Piper, pastor and author, says, As Christians, we belong doubly to God. He made us and He bought us. We can now do what we were made for. It's a great thrilling ability that only being filled in the Spirit gives us. And you're going to need that because uh, all throughout this room in different ways, He is going to call us and He has made us for circumstances and situations and environments that we don't like inherently. Certainly not in our sinful nature. Meaning, some of you want to be married and God has determined you're, you're to be single, at least right now. Some of you want to stay married and you weren't able to. You had a spouse abandon or betray or leave. Or, or you want to have children and you can't. Or you want to make more money than you make. Or you want to be healthier than, than you are. And again, a thousand different ways in which this can play. And God will regularly be putting you in circumstances and areas of life in which you are not going to want to be. This is a great reminder that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own. He decides how this goes. And good news, as temples of the Holy Spirit, we have all of the ability in those uncomfortable, unwanted situations to not only survive and glorify God, but thrive and be trophies of contentment and rest and power and influence and ability. And all of it is dependent on this filling. Now, go to Ephesians 5, and let me show you where I get all of this. If I'm reading... This text, as well as other descriptive text in the book of Acts, in which we read of people being uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be under the controlling influence of the Spirit. To be living in step and within, in submission and in rhythm with His ways and His leadings and His promptings and His abilities. But before we get to verse 18, which is the key verse of the passage, let me remind you of the context. It starts in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. As you have received Christ and now are a child of God, so walk in Him. As children of God, be imitators of Him. Mimic Him is the Greek word. How? By walking. There's our word again. That's a common metaphor in the New Testament to describe the Christian life. is one of walking. We walk with the Lord. We walk like the, the Lord. We walk in the Spirit. Things like that. And in verse 2 we read, We walk in love as Christ loved us. So there's the model. Verse uh, 8, same chapter. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the, in the Lord. That's an indicative. That's a proclamation of your identity. That's who you are. All of these imperatives always flow out of the indicatives. God always says, do this, don't do that, do that, after first saying, this is who you are, therefore. But you were once darkness, now you're light. Walk as children of light. Verse 13, I think, or no, 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. The physical metaphor is a beautiful metaphor for the spiritual life. Just as children learn, have to learn to walk, and that is an important, vital part of their growing into physical maturity and independence and living out who God made them to be as adults, they have to learn that. So spiritually, we have to learn to walk in the Spirit if we are to develop spiritual maturity and depth and be all that God has made us to be in that way. So we've got three commands in those verses. Walk in love, walk in the light, and walk wisely, not foolishly, but as a wise person. Okay, well, how do I do that? How do I walk like this? Well, verse 17 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
Well, what's the will of the Lord? You get asking questions. Well, let's do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. There's our, there's our phrase. Be filled with the Spirit. Now here I want to get pedantic. I want to get slowed down because it's essential. I want you to not only remember this and understand this, but I want you to remember and understand this and walk in it for the rest of your Christian life. That, that from here on, if you've not thought of the Christian life this way or have not been living this way, that today, because of some basic observation of the text, you will, your whole Christian life will just go to a soaring level of power and ability in the presence of God that you've never had before. And you can have it. I don't care who you are or where you've been or how long you've been a Christian. This is available to you. And the first thing I want to notice... Some of you are going to love this nerding out. Others of you are going to have to fight for it, but it will be worth it. This is an imperative command. This is not a suggestion or an option. Be filled with the Spirit. And it has with it all of the force of any of the other commands in, in the Bible. Particularly even chapter, chapter 5. When it says... Uh, don't be sexually immoral. That's a command. You have no more right to refuse being filled with the Spirit as you have a right to refuse being sexually pure or stealing or not or being uh, crass and uh, ungodly with your speech. This is an imperative command which right away should cue us that this ministry of the Spirit for the first time, there's, there's others, but for the first time in our series is over and apart and different from the other things we've looked at. You can look at all the teachings of Jesus in the gospel. You can look at all the teachings of the apostles in the book of Acts. You can look at all the other teaching of the, the New Testament books. And you will never find one command from God to people, be regenerated in the Spirit. Or be baptized in the Spirit. Or be indwelt by the Spirit. Never. Why? Because those are all gifts of the Spirit that He unilaterally gives us at conversion. When you put your faith in Christ, that is a result of the, the regenerating work of the Spirit that He decided to, to give you. You don't have to do anything. You didn't cooperate with it. You, just, you were just made alive. And when that happened, you were immediately, once for all, placed into the body of Christ. Baptized into the Spirit, meaning you shared in His power and his person same thing with christ you were sealed you have to do anything for that the spirit just sealed you but here we are clearly being told to do something to be filled which indicates that there is a level of cooperation that is expected if i'm to have this um so th th there's some area of of the uh, I don't want to use the word because I know some of you Calvinists will lose their mind, but will lose your mind. But uh, but but he he he's going to want your obedience to be to be a part of it. When I was driving home, getting the news about Jeff's death, I didn't need to pray, Holy Spirit, indwell me. He already did. Holy Spirit, uh, gift me. He'd already given me my my spiritual gifts. But I did need to pray, Holy Spirit. Fill me with power. Speaking of which, there's two, there's two commands, actually. It's not only be filled with the Holy Spirit, but there's a negative command that precedes it. Do not be drunk with wine. John Stott, in a great book with an ugly cover, Baptism in Fullness, uh, describes uh, this, this whole area of contrast and comparison with why... Paul would contrast being drunk with wine with being filled with the Spirit. Why, why that particular sin over and against this particular uh, command? He says, It's a great mistake to suppose that Spirit-filled believers are in some kind of drunken stupor. You might see that on TV. People claiming to be filled with the Spirit and just flopping around like they're drunk. He said, It would be a mistake. Or that such, in, uh, such a state is intended to be a pattern for 
uh, experience of the Spirit's fullness. The opposite is the case. There's a clear implication in Ephesians 5.18 that drunkenness and the Spirit's fullness are not comparable in that respect. For drunkenness is branded as excess in the King James or debauchery in the uh, Revised Standard Version. The Greek word is asotia, which in its two other New Testament occurrences means a condition in which a person cannot save or control themselves. They're out of control. The alcohol is in control in that instance. It's because drunkenness involves self-control. Paul writes that it is to be avoided. It is implied that the contrasting state is the fullness of spirit, which involves no loss of self-control. On the contrary, we are distinctly told in Galatians 5.23 that a part of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. The consequences of the full fullness of the Spirit, as the Apostle goes on to portray, are to be found in intelligent, controlled, healthy relationships with God and with each other. We can indeed agree that in both drunkenness and in the fullness of the Spirit, that two strong influences are at work in us. Alcohol in the bloodstream and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. But whereas excessive alcohol leads to unrestrained and irrational license, transforming a, drunken, a drunkard into an animal, the fullness of the Spirit leads to restrained and rational moral behavior, transforming the, image, uh, the Christian into the image of Christ. The results of being under the influence of the spirits on the one hand and of the Holy Spirit on the other are totally different. One makes us like beasts. The other one makes us like Christ. We are to be under the controlling influence of the Holy Spirit, which will result in a self-controlled, godly life. That's the point. It's imperative. You're commanded to do that, every single one of you. Second, I see it as in the plural form. That's why I say every single one of you. It is all y'all be filled with the Spirit. It's not just for specific ministers for a specific task in a specific time. It's for every single believer. These are all Christians. Every single one of them in the book of Ephesians. It's not just written to pastors. It's written to the church at Ephesus. Third, it's in the passive voice. We don't fill ourselves with the Spirit. We don't fill one another with the Spirit. You don't need to go to a, a, a faith healer or a preacher to come put their hands on you so that you can receive the Spirit. It, that would be middle voice or active voice. It's passive voice. You are filled with the Spirit. It is something the Spirit does with you and to you. However, since it's a command, we can't take this passive form or uh, this passive uh, voice, too far. We are expected to engage. But the way we engage is in a passive way. I think the words that I've written here to, to help me get it across is we actively yield to the Spirit. We intentionally and mindfully, with discipline and purpose and prayer, submit to the Scriptures. We actively remove sin from our life and we repent of it so that the spirit who can be quenched and grieved is able to have his full control and his full filling so as to, to do what he wants us to do. I've mentioned it, I think, previously in the series and a number of times. And I do it every single morning in different ways, different words, different aspects. But before I get out of bed, I will actively say to the Holy Spirit... I am your servant. This is your day. What is before me is your plan. The expectations and commands that I am to live out are, are your commands. Therefore, I need your power and your ability to do it. And in the crisis and the move and the flow of the day, I won't have the time or the wherewithal to think I need to pray or anything. So I'm asking now, just over the whole day, Pull off the Spirit's control in my life. 
That's what this is, to be filled with the Spirit. And then fourth and finally, the command is in the present tense. That means, and you've been around the teaching ministry here enough to know that whenever you, you, you see that the verb is in the present tense, it has the idea of a continual action. Ongoing, regular part of, of life. That you don't once for all say, fill me with the Spirit and now I'm forever filled. You, you, you will need to pray that and submit to that and yield to that every day, every year. Ongoing, regularly, consistently. Every hour. We even sing that song. We're going to sing that song. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Every second we actually need him. That's why this, is, this, is a, this analogy of walking is perfect too. Right? Do you, do you move about life without... I'm, not going, I'm going to no longer walk where I go today. You're, I'm going to be dragged or I'm going to kind of push. No, you're going to have, every day take one step after the next to move around life. And what happens as you get better at that? When you're first learning to walk, you're wobbly, you fall down, you're veering off to the side. You're not great at it. It takes more intentional thought to, to do this. And when you start in the Christian life, it will be that way. The more young you are in your faith or spiritually mature, immature you are in your faith, the more intentional perhaps you'll need. The more community and guardrails of people holding your hand as you go through the Christian life, you'll need. But as you grow in your filling of the Spirit and your ability to walk in step with the Spirit, you can attain to levels of not even realizing you're doing it. You're just sort of going through life under His control. You in that day are a spiritual person filled with the spirit now what should we expect and here's where we can get some disagreement within the christian church perhaps even in this church when a person is filled with the spirit what are the results there are some who believe and teach and perhaps have experienced supernatural miraculous abilities supernatural miraculous words or, or, or activities, or emotions. Uh, and I'll, get to, I'll kind of close speaking to some of that. But for now, uh, notice that, that the participles that far, follow the command but are connected to the main imperative verb don't indicate any of that. That the examples that Paul gives of a person who's filled with the Spirit are the most normal, ordinary, everyday, unimpressive from a human perspective uh, traits let's tick them off the first one do you see them uh, it is uh, addressing verse 19 singing and making into verse 19 giving in verse 20 submitting in verse 21 the first one in 19 addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual Songs, a sister passage that just begs to be read with this one is Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thank thankfulness in your hearts to God. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will discover that your words change. Your speech changes, not necessarily your voice or the kind of unintelligible speech that might come out of you, but meaning that your motive and your desire to speak is to build up, to encourage, to teach, uh, in appropriate context to rebuke, to call out, to, to clarify, to repent, to ask for repentance. That I am being filled with the Holy Spirit right now as I... Submitted to his word, I'm submitting to his, uh, his, his leading, I'm submitting to the gift of teaching that he's given me to explain the text to you, and you are being filled with the Spirit as you come with a receptive, ready heart to hear those words. That is all a part of this verse 19. We're addressing one another in the word of God, We're address, which is the next one, singing and making melody. We sing. 
That's why we sing in church. That's why the congregational voice is so important around here. Is because that's a mark and a distinguishing characteristic and trait of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Is we're not just singing to the Lord, we're singing to one another. So I need to hear you singing to me. And you need to hear me singing to you. And that means that if you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you sing. Not all of you sing, do you? I see. I'm not, I'm not keeping a list, and I'm not going to call you out. But, but not all of you sing. And you say, well, I'm not a very good singer. Believe me, this is a ministry to this church that I don't sing. Uh, no, we, we need to hear you sing. And you might say, well, Josh, you're a neat nick. It, it says in verse uh, uh, 20 or verse 19 that singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart doesn't say your mouth. It says with your heart. No, that's not what this is. This is a preposition of, of uh, manner, not a preposition of location. Singing by definition is to use your voice. That's what singing is. Okay, what's this saying? This is saying that you do it not just with your voice. You can sing the words and we can hear you and you can sing beautifully, but they're not coming from your heart. But when you're filled with the Spirit, you're singing from your heart. That you want to sing what we're singing. You're, they're thrilling to the words. You're being emotionally moved, which will be a future uh, sermon where we talk about the Spirit's involvement with our emotions. It does something to us by vibrating our, our uh, voice box. All right, third result, not only are we to address one another and how we speak and how we sing, but verse 20, we become thankful people, giving thanks Always, not just in the good, always. But what about this thing? In everything, to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the hallmarks of the Spirit-filled life is gratitude, contentment. Being thankful for the things that God has given you, rather than discontent with the things He hasn't, or the things that you, that you want. You show me a person who is a whiny, complaining, discontent, usually jealous, envious person. I will show you a person who is not filled with the Spirit. You show me someone who is content even in the most dire circumstances, and that is a spiritual, Spirit-filled filled person. And then the last one in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. That you have an attitude of submissiveness. This doesn't mean you become a human mule or a living doormat and just let people walk all over you. You can have a strong, courageous, convicting leadership style, but be a servant-hearted leader. You can be a husband who is leading the home and leading your wife spiritually and disciplining the children and raising them and teaching them, but doing it in a way in which you are constantly sacrificing and submitting your preferences and your rights and your own personal desires for the good of the home and the other. That is a spirit-filled leader. All right, that wasn't too painful, right? Now we're going to get into future te- uh, sermons and in future texts in which a person being filled with the Spirit will manifest in miraculous ways, or it's possible to. And some of you perhaps have had that. Others of you have not, and you're kind of defensive around that kind of thing. You're resistant. You're closed off. What, what, what is this experience that they've had and I haven't had? Is it real? Is it true? Is it biblical? What about the abuses? And and is it something that I'm doing wrong that I haven't had it? And and so I I need to somehow tap into some level of filling that will get me there. Okay, with that in mind, I close with three personal applications. And I'll hit three groups. First group is for those of you who may feel discouraged because you've not had any supernatural, miraculous, sensational manifestations of the Spirit. And maybe because of people you know or your own personal reflection, you you feel subpar. My word to you is extraordinary experiences are not necessary for Christian maturity. Exceptional, extraordinary experiences are not necessary 
for Christian maturity. Be encouraged that the place that Paul goes in the text in which he gives the command, be filled with the Spirit, he does not say, be filled but with the Spirit. Slaying people with your hand and they'll fall over. Be filled with the Spirit and whoever you pray for healing over, they'll be healed. Pray with the Spirit and you will, everybody you share the gospel with will come to Christ. doesn't promise that. He says, you be filled with the Spirit. It will change the way you speak. You'll be an encouraging person. You will sing with joy before the Lord these doctrines of grace that, that are not, they will come off of the page. You will be content wherever you are and you will be a servant-hearted person in your relationships. It's ordinary. Well, it seems ordinary, but get with me tomorrow morning and that will be a miracle if I live that way, right? Uh, one clarification, however, to you, and I, in my past, although I believe that God's showing me grace in this area, but I would say that I was more in this, this bucket. Let me warn you that you do not throw cold water on people who have had extraordinary, miraculous, supernatural experiences as they've been filled with the Spirit. Yes, let's be biblical. Yes, let's be discerning. Yes, let's keep our eyes wide open on whether or not this is true or not. But be tolerant. Be open. Be gracious to those who perhaps are walking in the outlet of the, the, the will of God in their life in a way that makes you uncomfortable or you've not experienced it. Second, to those of you who do put a lot of emphasis on that supernatural expression. Maybe it was your tradition or your past. You've come out of that denomination or you've just recently come into it. I know there are some of you who are there and I thank God that that's been your experience. You've claimed healing. You're claiming visions. You, you've got insight in, uh, into uh, dreams. On and on. That The scripture gives us descriptions of people who have done that. And I'm open perhaps that that is happening real in your life. Great. Wonderful. To you I say, being filled by the Spirit is for all believers. Not just you. But how that plays out in each life is up to God. Rejoice that God is doing that in your life and lean further into that. With a Bible in your hand, but lean further into that. But don't cram down everybody else's throat that they have to have that. Or they're somehow cold and quenching the Spirit. Because they, they aren't experiencing some of those things. Don't guilt people into living it out the way you're living it out. And then the third application will be to all of us. Let's enjoy our unity as we seek to build one another up in Christ. Let's enjoy our unity as we seek to, to build one another up in Christ. And to do that, that means that both sides of this camp and this issue, these issues need to stop stereotyping everybody. That if a person claims some of the manifestations or extraordinary works of the Spirit, that you just say, you're crazy and you need to go see a counselor or maybe get some meds. That might be the case, but it might not be. Or that a person who doesn't experience those things, well, that means that you're a frozen chosen your, your theology and your relationship with God is all academic. It's all in the head and no heart. Well, that's not true. Let's assume the best of one another and like every other aspect of our lives, realize that people are different. I've said it before and I make no apologies. I do not look for spiritual and supernatural manifestations in my life. In fact, I think it would freak me out if it happened and I don't want it. Why? Because I'm Josh Perry. I don't like drama. I don't like stuff like that. And so how gracious of God to say, Josh's Christian life will be happier if I don't freak him out with supernatural stuff in the Spirit. But other people do love that stuff. And God, as a good father, says, I'm going to give them some of those things. God loves to bless his people across a broad spectrum of personality and gifting and power and experiences. So let's just let him do it. Right? I mean, it was a great day when I was able to just release that God is going to bless Christians and churches and pastors and ministries in ways that I wouldn't do that. 
that he reserves the right to use churches and Christians and, and pastors uh, in, in ways that I, I, don't, I don't like. And they're people I don't like, frankly. I wouldn't go to their church, and I don't want to hang out with them, right? And God uses them anyway. You know what the good news is? Is there's a lot of people who feel that way about me, and God uses me. So that's good news, right? All right, I'm going to get in trouble. Let's pray. Go ahead, bow your head, and hopefully you're picking up that our God is not limited. He is not bound by our understandings or our expectations or our abilities. So we don't have to have the pressure to get him off of the hook that he's put himself on. He's fully capable of leading and building up his church. Father, uh, it's rough out there. And at times it seems like it's getting darker and darker all the time. And rather than leaving the world in a better place than we found it, uh, when we try to do that in our own ability, we end up just leaving the world with different problems. In fact, the only good that I see in my life and my world, I'm going to have to say, is, is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit. Who points us to Christ, who indwells all of your children here this morning and around the world. And if we're going to accomplish any good in our world and our life, it is, it is only going to happen as we are filled not with ourselves, but with your Spirit. How thankful we are for your Spirit. The living God who moves among us and through us. I ask that, Holy Spirit, that you capture our attention early in the day. That we can't get too far along in our our waking moments before we realize our need and begin to move close to you to meet it. And keep our thoughts on you as we move through the day. We need you to take charge in our lives in, in new ways and in fresh ways. Really, we want you to be all that you can possibly be within us. So we yield our lives for that spirit filling. We ask for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Redemption Church said. We're going to sing together as a form of a reflection on what we have just heard. So you're welcome to stand and sing along and let this be our prayer together.
over me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. seated now as we move into communion. As the servers come forward to the Lord's table to distribute the elements for the Lord's Supper, I want to read to you a rather unconventional passage for communion, but one that I believe is very true and especially uh, applicable to what we've heard here this morning. It's Jesus' words in John chapter 6, verse 47. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. But I am the bread that comes down from heaven so that you may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. He'll go on to say that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no part of him, which was a very hard saying for his disciples to hear and maybe for us to hear today. And so... We have to be filled with the Spirit to understand what Jesus is saying here. And I think what he means here is that his body and his blood, his physical body and his blood, are what was broken and poured out for us on the cross for the redemption of our sins. And John Calvin, the great reformer, said it this way, there's something supernatural that happens when we come together as a church and partake of his body and his blood. We are in a spiritual way taken up to be with Jesus. And so his physical presence is manifested among us as his church. And so as we pass these elements and as you crunch that cracker, um, think supernaturally, spiritually of his broken body for you. And as you taste the bitterness of the juice, think supernaturally, filled with the Spirit, His blood poured out for you. And be filled with the Spirit in the presence of Christ.
whenever you're ready at any point, you can stand and sing along. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. my song to rise to you when temptations come my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you one defense my one defense my righteousness oh god how i need thank you for worshiping with us this sunday and next sunday don't forget is what mother's, mother's day. day don't forget dads and kids that you're to honor your mother every day, but especially next Sunday. And so to do that here at Redemption, we'll have a light breakfast when you first get in here, come a little bit early and eat a little breakfast, Mom. And Laura Keffer is going to sit up her little uh, family photo booth and offer to take family photos. So be a part of that too. Uh, hold out your hands as we receive the benediction as we're dismissed. Now may the Holy Spirit fill you with all his power, presence, and purpose for the life and joy God has called us to. May we seek to be filled by the Holy Spirit in obedience to the Lord's command while we receive it as the blessing to equip us 
to walk in the ways of the Lord. Go now from this place, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and his filling empower you in all godliness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're dismissed.